boy, do I have a cool old quilt for you today. So in this episode of Lessons from an Old Quilt, I am going to be reviewing this old quilt. But before we get started talking about this, my name is Chris O'Neill from Sew the Distance. Thank you for joining me. So this quilt I purchased at a community yard sale for $20. The woman who sold it to me said it was her ex great father-in-law. So I guess her ex-husband's grandfather's quilt. It was made, she thinks, in the 1940s or 1950s, and he did construct it. His name was Mr. Borges. That's all I got. I didn't get a first name. But uh, Mr. Borges created this quilt, and it has a really unique way of uh, being constructed, especially after I dug in and started to really investigate how it was made. So it's a really cool quilt cool crazy quilt even and uh, with some awesome stitching. So let's take a closer look at this cool crazy quilt. Okay so before we start talking about the front of the quilt I'm going to do things a little different. I'm going to show you the back of the quilt because there's this giant hole in the back and uh, I like it when there's holes because sometimes I can really learn a lot about the construction but I also don't like it because you know, you don't want to ever see anything like this destroyed. Uh, so if we peek inside here, and hopefully you can see that, I can tell you exactly how it was constructed just by looking inside. And the first thing I noticed is, is machine pieced, okay? And uh, then I also poked around a little bit and then we see the embroidery stitches coming through here, which I found interesting. Also, because this foundation was machine pieced. I thought, okay, so he pieced this all together on top of one another, like the fabric on top of one another. But that's not the case because if we look at the other side, where that pieced foundation is, there's a whole piece of fabric. Okay, so I had to really think about this. Okay, how was this made? And what I determined from poking around here and poking around on the front in other holes is that this maker, he took a piece of fabric and pieced that together as his foundation, which it blows my mind. And then put these fabrics on top of that foundation and attached it and then applied other pieces on top of it. Okay, so he, this is like the ultimate scrap use what you have quilt because not only is this scrappy, the front of it, but the foundation that nobody is ever gonna see see is also scrappy. Another cool thing is that the foundation here is machine pieced together and it looks like all kinds of different types of fabrics too but this on top is all done by hand. I find that so cool and it just kind of blows my mind. So let's take a look at the front of this and the fabrics that we have. It is super duper heavy it's a little stinky, it needs to be washed, but I have to repair some of these holes before I wash it. Uh, and I wanted to show you the inside before I washed it too, so I could show you that. All right, so we have these blocks that are made up of fabrics that we know now are applique onto a foundation and um, probably even some stitch and flip methods, okay? And then they're embroidered the seam lines are embroidered. So that brings me to my next comment about this because I was so confused. I was looking at this and I see that they're embroidered, but the embroidery lines do not come through to the back. So that tells me that I need to look deeper. And when I did, I realized that he actually embroidered this, I believe it's the feather stitch. I know there's some controversy. When I look at it closely, it looks like the feather stitch to me. I know it could be a herringbone, uh, I know, uh, I think there's another name for it. I'll put it up on the screen. I think this is the feather stitch when I looked into it, but that's, I guess, not that important, right? Uh, but he actually quilted underneath. After he embroidered this, he went in and quilted, and you can see some of the quilt lines underneath the embroidery to hold it all together. How interesting and cool is that. It's just a totally different way of looking at it and a different way of making a quilt. And as we know, there are many, many, many ways to make a quilt. So back to the fabrics. These fabrics are heavy weight. Most of them are wools. And the reason I know that is because my mother's allergic to wool and she couldn't even touch this quilt. So there's uh, that. But we also see some silks. There's a few denims and heavier weights. There's some upholstery fabrics. And uh, it really is just what I think this maker had on hand. Uh, so 
if we look at these embroidery stitches though, we can see there's many different colors. I believe that where the color changes, uh, he actually changed the thread. It's not a variegated thread because it's not gradual, the change. So I think he was using up what he had, which is also really cool. Now there, let me take you over here to this side and you can see some of the silks are coming up and fraying. And again, we get to peek inside and look, there's another scrap of fabric underneath there for the foundation. Uh, he made these wonderful curves in different places and really uh, made it interesting as well. I have another one here that has a lot of fraying. Make sure that's in the frame here. Uh, and you can see that there's a plaid underneath that. So there are some damaged spots, but they can be easily repaired, I think. I think I'll just put another piece over top of it and embroider and it'll be as good as new. Uh, and we even see when the um, batting coming through. This is called bearding. And you can see that here. Okay, and that's where that batting is just working its way through. Now, I said that he quilted underneath all the embroidery. He did do that, but he also quilted some within. So you can see some quilt lines here by the bearding, and you can see some on this black, like, uh, I don't know, that's definitely a wool fabric right here going through. And there's a few other places like that too. So it's just a really cool quilt. Each block is 17, let me move it over here, super heavy, sorry. <laughs> Be out of breath by the time I'm done with this. Each of these blocks is uh, 17 and a half by 17 and a half. And the total quilt, like I said, is 70 by 70. There are 16 of these blocks and they're put together. Um, you know, the points don't exactly match, <laughs> it, but it doesn't matter because this overall look of this quilt is, you know, very um, crazy as we know. And it is just a really neat, piece. I love it. Uh, and so does my dog. So you can see she kind of inherited this quilt or loves this quilt. Maybe it's because it's so stinky. So let's look at the back again. Flip it over. You can see it's this plaid flannel. There are um, some seam lines in the flannel, but uh, they're hard to notice. I had to really look for them too. But you can see on the back all the quilting lines that follow the quilting stitches, or should I say the crazy stitches and embroidery on the front. The binding is wrapped around from the back, so it's the same, and it is hand tacked down. So to recap, this quilt, the foundation of these blocks was done by machine. So the maker took scraps of fabric, it looks like cotton, pieced them all together to make a foundation. Then the maker appliqued and placed these fabrics on top of that and some of them are using the stitch and flip method, some are just plain applique. Then he embroidered all of the stitches, then he sandwiched it and quilted it. There are so many ways to make a quilt, and this is just yet another example. So it's just fascinating and I, I love this. Now I would be remiss if I did not talk about this one fabric that seems to show up here, and that's this pink fabric. Uh, so there's another one that looks similar to it here, this purple, they almost seem out of place, but um, I really love that it's in there. It gives a sense of, of femininity almost, or um, I don't know, maybe even just interest in what would normally be a very masculine quilt. So I love that he included those fabrics in here. So what can we learn from this really cool wool quilt? Mr. Borges obviously put a lot of time and energy into making this quilt. And the first thing that I think I can learn at least from this quilt is to use what you have. So he had access probably to wool because we are in a farming community and we are close to Woolrich, Pennsylvania. And when the factory was still there, there was a lot of wool. He might have gotten it there or he had old clothing that he used, but either way he used up what he had, including the foundation. Now the foundation, once I got to thinking about it after I recorded the last segment, could have been an old quilt that was kind of falling apart that he decided to use as the foundation, or he could have taken scraps of fabric to make that foundation. Either way, he used what he had. And I think that's something we can all learn from. Uh, you know, I'm guilty of buying the latest and greatest, newest lines of fabric, but you know what? We can just use what we have too to make quilts. Now that said, that brings me to my second lesson, 
which is to know the materials that you have. So we see in this quote where there is fraying on some of the silkier fabrics, we see some bearding, uh, and we see some other construction issues because of the fabrics breaking down. I'm sure that Mr. Borges wasn't thinking that Chris O'Neill was someday going to review this on a YouTube channel or that it was even going to maybe even last as long as it did, okay? Uh, but had he considered that, maybe he would have considered putting some sort of other backing on that fraying material, that silky material, just to stabilize it a little bit more. And that could have been another piece of wool or a piece of denim or something that he had. But of course, you know, I'm not criticizing the guy. I mean, come on, this is a pretty incredible quote, right? Uh, but as makers now, we know that we need something underneath that to um, distribute that weight when we use lighter weights with heavier weights. So know your materials if you are using non-traditional materials. Know what you need to do to stabilize them and do the research with that and it will make your quilts just last a lot longer. And the last thing I want you to think about or to learn from this is to consider alternative constructions. We have rules in quilting and the you know they talk about the quilting police and what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do and all of these crazy things and I've talked about this before let's throw the rules out the window okay yeah they're good to have and yes when you're learning to quilt some of those guidelines are very helpful but come on this construction teaches us that you can make a quilt and use construction techniques that maybe aren't what you know you're being taught in a quilting class but you figure out a way to get that constructed however that may be. And who knows, maybe you're gonna come up with the next construction technique that nobody else has thought of. So experiment with that. See if there's another way to do something. Try out new techniques. Become creative within our creativity. Thank you so much for watching today. Please consider subscribing and uh, stay tuned for my next Lessons from an Old Quilt, which is going to be a full polyester quilt that is really interesting. I can't wait to share it with you. Uh, I will see you soon and have a great week. Make sure you take some time to sew.